Okay, welcome back then. We are in late October 1857. I think we, we've uh, sort of left off in July uh, where we basically accepted the Austrian peace proposal. My suggestion was we would rejoin kind of next turn. Upon passing turn, it was immediately obvious to me uh, that that was fairly pointless. All that had happened, of course, is that Austrian territory, for the most part, had returned to Austria. Their process of payments had begun. The Italians had moved in very quickly and easily to retake Vienna as we left. Fair play to them. And that's it. That's sort of the war over. And, and all that was really happening is our troops were returning back to their various bases. And I thought it would actually be worthwhile that we left it a few turns, maybe even a, sort of a, a couple of months, two, three months, just to get our boys back to their kind of um, their original bases and to have a bit of a think, kind of contemplate on the war, look at what our take homes are and stuff like that. So we're going to do that in this video. And I should point out as well that God knows why there was such a desync in the last video. I, I've noticed it with a couple of videos. It's been ever so slight. And I've also seen it with other people that have uploaded videos into YouTube that there can be this kind of slight desync um, in, in terms of the, the sound. And it was quite pronounced in the last video. And yeah, apologies for that. Very strange indeed. Um, but I hope in, in any case it was clear enough to follow. So let's have a look at the key take-homes then from the war with Austria. Obviously the outcome was sensational. It was far beyond anything that we could have anticipated or hoped for at the beginning of the war. It was a kind of bit of a you know, uh, something that was even suggested at the beginning of the war would be an outstanding outcome, but it was not something that I'd seriously expected. Um, I didn't think the war would go nearly as good as that. I thought that Austria would probably be a much tougher proposition than Russia. It turned out to be a, a much easier war, although we had at our disposal more forces, you know. One of the key things, of course, is that we were very, very lucky in more ways than one. Um, Austria is a force to be reckoned with, but it, it turned out that it was simultaneously fighting Piedmont Sardinia, and not just that, but that Piedmont Sardinia had real game and were themselves, you know, bringing to the table a really, really serious effort. And I think probably that served to cause the Austrians to teeter totter between, you know, what side to commit their forces to. This created a bit of a strategic paralysis that we were able to exploit. We were very lucky, though. We should we should absolutely have a sense of proportion. The idea that we did this kind of great a historical thing that the Ottomans had never achieved and sacked, you know, uh, Vienna and, and just did all this kind of damage to the Austrians is wonderful. It doesn't mean that we can kind of, you know, we've returned to the kind of age of, of Suleiman or Selim or any of these kind of great, you know, sort of Mehmed, the conqueror. When we haven't, you know, we're still very much in a far weaker position than we have been in, in prior centuries. But it was a very, very good outcome. I think one of the important take-homes is that, unlike the war with, with Russia, um, we were much less dependent on the kind of individual gift of, for example, like a great commander like Omar Pasha. It's very good that we have good commanders, and we always seek to cultivate good commanders, but we don't want an army that is completely dependent on one commander, because that leaves us in a very vulnerable position. And in this case... I think for the most part, the rest of the army fought well. You know, there were upsets, of course, Hussein Avni and Abdul Karim Nadir tried to pr push the Sava, and that was a bit of an upset. And at times, Hussein Avni looked like he was struggling on the left flank around Zagreb. But for the most part, they did well. Both of those commanders were able to score convincing victories against Austrian forces of a similar size. In some cases, Austrian forces that are even larger. So that's a really, really key, ta uh, important take home. The quality of the army is good, but it is also something that we're going to be looking to drive forward, and I'll, I'll uh, back to that shortly. The other thing is the importance of kind of um, administration, that is to say, the supplies and logistics of our army. One of the really, really key things is that we lay the foundations for offensive actions deep into the Austrian Empire by carefully planning in advance the creation of supply depots in Zvornik and in Sarajevo, uh, the fortification of those depots and creating hubs that we could kind of operate from. You know, those kind of things have to be done in advance, and it required quite some time, actually, before those things were completed, before we could get the, you know, the supplies into place. And there was a period where we had to kind of shuttle supply trains between, for example, Sofia and the kind of um, uh, the, the Bosnian kind of area. But that, that was really, really good. We recognized that, and that's something that we're always going to have a focus on. And when we look at kind of future planning, I think that's going to be something that has to be front and center of future planning as well, future war plans. And there's going to be more on future war plans also in a moment. So supplies and logistics. The, or, the, the other thing that was really important to the success in the early stages of the campaign was by taking a really procedural kind of approach to warfare, which is to say by having kind of set plans, which we never had with Russia. With Russia, we had a rough idea of what we might do, subject to what we thought the Russians would do. As it turns out, our 
predictions about the Russian move on Plevna. It never came to pass, but nevertheless, we were kind of magicking, you know, magicking up a plan a little bit as things went, and we never really had the initiative, and we just didn't have enough forces at our disposal at that time, you know. Our kind of capitalist economy was much more kind of, you know, industrial economy was much more embryonic. We didn't have any kind of like industrial military complex. We weren't supplying our own ammunition or supplies. We were dependent on imports and this kind of thing. That shaped the character of that war a little bit. That was far less the case with the war against Austria. You know, before the war began, I had even talked about in some videos about what we would probably sort of do. And it was a soft plan. But it was a plan nonetheless, and it was a plan that was largely fulfilled. And the plan was always to secure the Zvornik Gap, build a fortress, build a logistics hub, then use that as a base to conduct operations towards Sarajevo, which we did. And then once we did that, to use Sarajevo again as a large hub, build up a really big logistics hub here, and then use that as a basis for kind of further operations. And when the attack against the Sava failed, the, the, the attempt to kind of make a rather sudden move into Hungary initially failed, we then developed a plan to, to clear the Dalmatian coastline, which, again, Dalmatian coastline took longer than expected. Kato held out for a long time. That fortress has been completely destroyed, of course, now. Um, but that kind of procedural approach that made a lot of sense, covering flanks, making sure that our forces could support each other, that was all really, really good stuff. And that's another really important take home. And it's led me to think that, look, we don't, you know, we don't want any wars now, hopefully, for, I think, 10 years, something like that. It'd be really good now to have a long period of time to focus on kind of exploiting new technologies, rapid economic development, exploitation of kind of, you know, coal and railways and things like this. And we're on the cusp of a new era, a new, you know, a dawn, really, a kind of almost a rebirth of the Ottoman Empire, it feels like, in some ways. Um, but, that doesn't mean to say that we don't use that peace time to start giving really careful thought and consideration um, to strategic planning. And indeed, in the mid-19th century, warfare is becoming a much more scientific business, and we can see that. I mean, in the war with Austria, we saw the first large-scale use of railroads for strategic redeployment of Austrian troops. We could actually see the locomotives. They were spotted by our troops, and they appeared on the map as a kind of locomotive icon, suggesting that troops were being redeployed. And... That's interesting, of course, and that's something that we're going to be looking at as we begin to develop railways deeper, deeper into the Balkans and also into eastern Anatolia. So that's another important take home, the importance of strategic planning, and that's something that we're going to give some serious thought to. Now, the first thing that we're going to do when we kind of address and look at those things is to introduce a large army reform plan beginning now in 1857, the idea being that it'd be broadly complete by 1860. And the plan is thus, our basic deployments are as they were before the war. The first army under uh, Mushi Omar Pasha is uh, based in the center with three, uh, three subject commanders, Abdi, Ahmed and Mehmed Rashid. And that's comprised of a guard corps, two army corps, two cavalry divisions, one independent artillery regiment, and then various kind of support, support forces in a supply train. That's the main army, and the, the, that's the real kind of iron in the glove, of course, is Omar Pasha's central command at Adrianople. European theatre command then uh, falls to Hussein Avni Pasha, three, uh, three infantry corps. Uh, two of them are, well, one of them is a completely conscript corps, one of them is a partially trained conscript corps, one of them is a full-blooded um, infantry corps with three artillery, independent artillery regiments, various support asset units, and a supply train. And the other army, the third army in the east, which is almost at its base in Ezerum, is of course Abu Karim Adir. Uh, again, comprised of three army corps. Uh, one of them is a conscript corps, which has now been largely trained and functions in basically the same way as a regular infantry corps. Two cavalry divisions, two independent artillery uh, regiments, and then again various support asset units and so on, and also um, and, and also a supply train. So that's the third army. What we're going to do is from the Eastern Army, Abdul Karim Nadir's army, and from the European Theatre Army, if you like, the second army under Hussein Avni, is we are going to remove an army corps, the least effective army corps. In this case, with Hussein Avni, it'll probably be the one that's an entirely conscript corps. We're going to remove these army corps from these army armies, and we're probably going to dissolve them. And we're going to replace them with guard corps. This is we're going, to, we're going to be expanding the Imperial Guard significantly. The Imperial Guard, at the moment, is much like a guard force in a European army, which is to say that it's a specialised, one-off, crack infantry corps that contains a lot of specialist equipment, 
highly trained hand-picked men that are physically more imposing uh, also they're going to be especially kind of ideologically devout and they're going to have a lot more officers of course be, uh, junior officers that are able to exercise kind of um, independent decision making on the battlefield these are our crack troops and we will remember that our guard corps uh, under Hussein uh, under Omar Pasha when he was a two-star general conducted an incredible operation from Adrianople into Romania and almost rolled up an entire Russian army. It was incredible, absolutely sensational. What we're going to be doing is sort of refounding the Janissaries in all but name, uh, which is to say we're not going to be calling them the Janissaries. They're not going to have any kind of legal immunity or political privileges, but we're going to basically create a kind of core around which every army is organized, a core of elite professional shock troops. So we're going to create an, uh, a guard corps. These are very expensive to build. A guard corps for Hussein Avni's army. So a third of his teeth arms, if you like, are going to be elite shock troops around which the rest of the army organizes. And the same is going to be the case for Abdul Karim Nadir. They'll have two regular infantry corps and a guard corps. So we're going to expand the Imperial Guard to kind of recreate the idea of a really large shock force that exists across our army, not just a very, very small elite force, which is what it is. So uh, a, a guard corps is, is what? Let's have a look at its kind of um, its actual size and character. A guard corps is comprised of just under 30,000 men. Um, it contains more guns, it contains slightly more horses, and again, a lot more officers. They're very expensive to build. But yeah, a massive expansion of the Imperial Guard in order to kind of replicate the Janissaries, a large standing kind of now you know we have a large standing army anyway uh, a professional army but a kind of shock force within that army so the, the imperial guard is going to be expanded by three times basically the other thing is we're going to create an arsenal at adrianople an arsenal is going to be uh, we already have a very large modern expanded fortress at adrianople but it's going to be a place for example where we're going to store various kinds of units so for example siege guns which can be moved on railways and we should start building some siege guns let's not forget that we were the first power on earth to use, use siege guns to break down large fortresses so we're going to uh, build a stockpile of siege guns that can be located on rails to join any army that is uh, besieging um, uh, besieging a city we're also going to stockpile um, in the arsenal uh, various supply trains so that we can organize a supply shuttle system if the supplies of an army need to be expanded for example and various kinds of specialist units like engineers so for example once our railways have been expanded in the Balkan Peninsula in the event that small cavalry brigades break through for maybe from Russia or Austria whoever else they begin tearing up rail lines we could very quickly move engineers out and, and, and conduct repairs very quickly so we're going to have a specialized uh, group of engineers in Adrianople whose entire job is to maintain the railway network basically and uh, also in the event of a possible siege for example uh, you know we're at war with any power say france makes a landing in albania and it looks like they're probably going to move uh, on salonica we can move engineers into the fortress at salonica to provide their support to provide kind of defensive emplacements and this sort of thing also we're going to begin to stockpile adrianople uh, with various kind of uh, counter siege weapons also uh, so for example large heavy artillery placements these things can be moved on railway for example north towards Constanta or again um, towards uh, Salonika and so on and so forth or indeed they can be uh, moved to Constantinople lifted by sea uh, taken to Sinop or Trabzon or, or something like this so we're going to start building a large arsenal of kind of siege you know heavy guns siege guns um, counter siege battery emplacements that can be moved by rail and uh, engineers specialized sort of uh, field units and maybe even some military police as well this sort of thing so that's the other kind of big thing for the army reform the other thing is during the war with austria at one point we captured an entire staff command in uh, i believe it was eastern hungary of officers who offered us their service uh, these were hungarian officers it's a hungarian unit and they offered to put together an entire army corps of light infantry using the captured equipment using the uniforms that they had various bits of captured kit the, the weapon systems that they were familiar with all of these kind of things and that this for you know out out of out of the prisoners of war hungarian prisoners of war and such and that this would uh, this would offer us a permanent force of hungarian loyalists of hungarian dissidents from prisoners of war we're going to maintain this force in perpetuity and its base is going to be the fortress at sarajevo 
This will be a focal point for any Hungarian dissidents, maybe even some Croats and other ethnic groups. Um, but dissidents who are looking to kind of, uh, you know, who are um, who are you know against Habsburg rule and this kind of thing, they could cross the border um, into into uh, Bosnia and they can join, uh, you know, a bit like our kind of Gurkhas, if you like. They can join our specialised Hungarian kind of loyalist. Uh, army corps. So this is going to provide, this will be a permanent defense also. Their job will always be to defend Sarajevo. So it's a new specialist kind of force that we've got. We're going to maintain that. We've got that at the moment set to an evade combat and a passive posture just to facilitate much faster. I mean this force was basically, it was a skeleton of a handful of officers and some captured siege guns not, you know, six weeks ago. Um, so it's it's already massively expanded into a serious force with various elements. We've got light infantry you know, they've even captured, they've even maintained their banners, the original names of their regiments. We're absolutely fine with that. Uh, they can call themselves whatever they want, but these are um, Ottoman soldiers. Um, you know, they are Hungarian dissidents in our service. And, you know, the, the Ottoman Empire has, has a long and rich tradition of service, uh, of offering service to, to various kind of dissidents, the Balkans and stuff. Again, uh, Musha Omar Pasha himself, uh, the great general, you know, was himself a Serb. Uh, that had, uh, had once served in the Austrian army. He was an administrator at the Austrian Imperial College and so on and so forth. And he's now, uh, you know, indispensable as a senior officer in the Ottoman army. That's the other part of the army reform. And for the most part, that's it. The other thing that we're going to be considering is redeveloping a rapid reaction force at Smyrna, comprised of uh, probably two marine brigades, um, mixed forces, maybe we need some mobility, so maybe a cavalry brigade, um, some artillery, and maybe some specialist units as well, field hospital units and engineers and so on. And the purpose of this force, it will maintain a position in Smyrna. The command of this force will be given to um, Abdi Pasha, who had formerly been the commander of the uh, Imperial Guard. He will maintain uh, his position at Smyrna with the Rapid Reaction Force. The purpose of this force, of course, will be to land on Greek islands in the event of some kind of insurgency developing there, rapid redeployment to the Levant in the event of any kind of difficulties or problems there, but, and also to support the fairly substantial garrison we have in our colony in Saranaika and Tripolitania. Um, so that is also another part um, of our reform. The, the force that we have in Yemen, we're going to maintain actually as it is and we're going to maintain that force there permanently you can already see from the map we've had a real upset in Yemen things were going really well it looked like we had largely pacified the country what has happened now is another large-scale revolt and it gets worse um, that revolt instantly was able to storm and take uh, the fortress at Aden the real mistake that we didn't make with this fortress was to have not have a permanent kind of full standing um, defense division basically inside like a fortress division what we actually had were people that were called up or would be mustered or mobilized in the event of a siege in this case the the, the you know there wasn't sufficient time to do that probably within the town itself uh, it was taken over from inside so a real oversight on our part we've really paid the price there and we're looking at again at, at a much more sort of complex situation uh, we are moving uh, Zarif Mustafa's force back to Aden as well as the cavalry division which is going to do that via Taiz and we're going to begin clearing the kind of um, eastern part of Yemen. Uh, what we're also going to have to do in Yemen now is we've mostly focused on targeting combat units once they are formed. It's not sufficient to do that. What we're going to have to start doing once we kind of clear, reconsolidate the kind of western part um, of the colony is looking at um, military expeditions to actually pacify the population. This essentially means that we are conducting military operations against um, these forces before they form, if you like. Um, it's rather bleak stuff, but it's a part, I suppose, of kind of like colonial warfare that these expeditions will look, I suppose, to find military age males and stuff like that, separate them and isolate them or do whatever is done. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll have to begin to conduct actual military expeditions uh, in these regions um, before these units are formed with a view of pressing revolt risks down and pacifying the region, uh, providing a much more sort of long-term basis for pacification. Having military units that are constantly engaging these forces once they coalesce, once they form, once they arm, uh, will just mean a state of perpetual warfare and, uh, you know, uh, at huge expense as well. You know, we're losing, again, a kind of uh, economic infrastructure, colonial infrastructure that we've invested, both private capital and also state revenue into developing. So a long-term uh, policy now has to be the case before we begin to press kind of towards the uh, east of the colony we'd have to pacify the west completely using military expeditions 
To conduct military expeditions against the populace requires us to have an army unit in the territory, basically. So, for example, what it takes going to take nine days for Zarif Mustafa, uh, yeah, sorry, uh, yeah, Zarif uh, Mustafa to get to Aden. He will look to clear this area, retake the depot, retake the fortress. It, I mean, it looks like the fortress has actually been destroyed. All that's there is a depot. So they destroyed everything, the harbour, the fortress, you know, uh, the mission, the church we had there, everything. All of these things have been burnt and destroyed. So, to that end, yeah, we'll have to kind of rebuild those things and completely pacify Aden, rebuild a, a proper fortress. Get that fortress stocked with a kind of um, a fort, you know, a, a, a full standing um, kind of um, uh, garrison force, not one that is simply mustered in the event of uh, of a rebellion or a siege, because that can take time. That's it in terms of our military reforms then, and quickly, uh, I suppose, addressing the colonial kind of uh, upset. That's it. The other part of the the, uh, the military reform is going to have to be the navy. Now, the navy has not been touched since 1850. Um, it's, the Ottoman Navy is not in bad shape. You know, it contains some screw ships, uh, but it's pr it's principally a traditional age of sail fleet, and it didn't suffer from the same kind of decay that the army did. So it didn't have to be completely reformed. Uh, but it is looking tired. It's looking dated. Um, it's probably the fifth. I would say the fifth standing. One, two, three. Uh, it's the fourth. Yeah. So it looks like it's the fourth. Uh, the fourth largest fleet on Earth, or the fourth most capable fleet on Earth. I'm not sure if in total numbers it probably is the largest, but obviously it's going to be Britain, uh, the United States, and then France, and we're fourth. Um, we are going to look to expand the Navy. Um, now, the Navy currently consists of eight um, ship of the lines, you know, multi-decker ship of the lines uh, spread over two, um, two squadrons um, in the main Imperial fleet in Constantinople. Also, the fleet is comprised of 20 frigates um, spread over five squadrons. Eight of those frigates are the newer type screw frigates. That's these squadrons here are screw frigates. The other frigates is one squadron inside the main fleet. And also we have in the raiding fleet two uh, squadrons of traditional, uh, just pure sort of age of sail frigates. Um, in addition to that, we have um, eight corvettes spread over two squadrons. One squadron being in the raiding fleet in Smyrna. And also uh, an, another squadron um, is based in, in the main fleet. That's the full size of our navy. That's the full complement of our navy. Our plan is going to be that we're going to be building, let's have a look, eight, an additional 16 corvettes, uh, which will be spread over four squadrons. So we're going to increase really the lighter element of the fleet to begin with. Um, the reason we're going to just be doing this for now is that we already know uh, from our technological research, our scientific research, from our kind of maritime engineers, that we are on the cusp of a significant change in terms of naval design. And it, it therefore kind of makes sense for us to hold off and to look at where this is going. Obviously, the rapid development of railroads, new kinds of technologies is going to have an impact on the fleet. Spending a huge amount on the fleet now, massively expanding the fleet, you know, and then all, a lot of these ships all of a sudden become rather obsolete. It means that we could have a very large but a slightly outdated fleet, and it, it could only be in five years' time. We're in a period of very, very fast-changing technology. Um, so we need to kind of have a look at you know where these designs are going, how long it's going to take us to get access to new designs. There's already a theoretical design for ironclad and wooden ships, which will have some practical input. At some point, ships are going to be built using iron and then possibly even one they steel. You know, so we need to kind of consider that. Um, so to that end, we're going to expand the lighter element of our fleet. The reason we're going to do that is because, well, we have, um, so we've got one flotilla of light raiding ships at Smyrna. Uh, we're basically going to create an entirely new flotilla. We're going to remove one of the traditional kind of frigate um, squadrons from this, and around that, we're going to um, add an additional two squadrons of corvettes, and then we're going to add another squadron of corvettes to this fleet, uh, to, if you like, sort of um, replace the loss of a squadron of, uh, of frigates. Basically, we're going to create an additional um, raiding fleet. It's going to be commanded by um, Mushavir Pasha, uh, if you like, the spare admiral uh, that we have in, in Constantinople. And that force is going to take up position. We don't know yet, but it's going to be somewhere... Um, in the Indian Ocean. So we, we're looking at possible candidate locations for its base. Basra, at the moment, in its current state, is probably the best candidate. 
The other possibility is Q8, which would require some upgrading, and it's also only a protector, it's suited to make it a formal colony. Or in the event that these territories are made into formal colonies, we could look at one of them as possibly a location where we could build a large uh, military port. Or the other possibility, of course, is Aden, although in the short term that doesn't look terribly favourable because we don't control the region and we just lost the harbour that we built there. But nevertheless, we're going to be looking to build. Um, a lighter, small raiding fleet comprised of two squadrons of corvettes, one of traditional frigates based in either the Persian Gulf or somewhere in the Indian Ocean. That will be used obviously for different reasons. In the event of a war with a major power, we can look at possibly trade interdiction um, in the Indian Ocean. Um, but also, um, we get lots of reports, for example, of pirates in the Red Sea, Persian Gulf, uh, so, you know, kind of anti piracy activity, and also possibly supporting interests. That we might begin to develop in a few locations one for example is the horn of africa uh, the other might be for example um, the area which is currently only influenced by um, portugal which is uh, mozambique the other area and these are by the way are all areas where the ottomans had interest in the past the other area uh, will be the island of is this the island of sumatra i think um Yeah, this is, uh, the island of Sumatra, uh, which is at this stage only an influenced territory. Uh, that's con that, you know that, that's uh, yeah, the Dutch are obviously looking to expand. They're looking to expand from I think this is Jakarta. Uh, let's have a look. Yeah, oh, Java. Okay, so this is Java, uh, which is a much more traditional kind of Dutch colony. But they're looking to expand. They're, the Dutch are looking to expand their kind of operation in Southeast Asia to include the island of Sumatra, which is overwhelmingly Islamic and is an area. Where I think this part of the island, which is Acre, I believe it's still largely independent. This part of the island uh, it has some measure of uh, Dutch colonial penetration. This was once, uh, a couple of centuries ago, an Ottoman protectorate, and there's a real commercial basis to this. Now look, our, this is not like a sandboxy type game. You know, our job is really to function as like a bureaucracy or a civil service that represents the interest of our ruling class and the wishes of you know, the ruling house, the Osmanli ruling house, and the nobility, and so on. And to that end, our job is really to uh, kind of expand in those areas where they have an interest. Let's have a look at, for example, the uh, Ministry of Colonial Affairs. So the Ministry of Colonial Affairs, we already know what the aims and objectives of the Ottoman ruling house is, and um, what the ruling class is in the Ottoman Empire. And those are these green areas here, where these are stated aims, publicly stated aims. It means they have prestige attached to them. The Ottoman ruling house has publicly already made it clear that they consider the Arabian Peninsula as theirs, um, that as a natural area for expansion, and this is the area that we're looking to col uh, colonize. In a lot of ways, much of it already has been Iraq, uh, you know, like um, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine. These areas have already been colonized, and Hajez is a protectorate, and of course, we're in the process of trying to convert um, Yemen into a protectorate. Uh, Kuwait is a is a protectorate, um, as is Qatar, uh, Dubai, and Bahrain. Uh, these areas are protectorates. So, it, you know, in the short term, uh, and also I should say that Libya, of course, is a fully fledged colony now. In the short term, we're looking to raise the level of Kuwait, Qatar, Bahrain, and Dubai to full colonial status. Because these are the pub areas where the ruling class are publicly claimed, and it's a priority that we do that, that we follow their wishes because these are publicly stated aims, they have prestige attached to them. However, it doesn't mean to say that we, with regard to colonial areas, that it would not be expedient to look at the possibility of expansion elsewhere. I'll be frank, there's a really good possibility. Uh, I don't know, I'm not someone that read codes or any, uh, reads code in games or anything like that, but there's a possibility that we might lose some of our European territories. That might not even be the worst thing. These areas are running sores. You know, they can be quite expensive to sort of maintain our position here. There is prestige attached to it. But nevertheless, there's a chance that some events might be out of our control. Other events aren't. And furthermore, it would be financially expedient to actually develop a presence in some areas. So let's have a, have a look at, for example, uh, the island of Sumatra. This is a wonderfully resource-rich location. We currently import timber, and we're going to be importing timber long-term. We do not have enough dom domestic access to commercial forestry or logging to be able to develop a timber industry that can support our economy. Control of Sumatra would completely change that. We could already see really great domestic access, or really great sort of colonial access to timber, also tobacco production, which would complement the tobacco production we currently have. Also, if we have real serious problems with our colonial provinces, it would be good to maintain a healthy tobacco industry. Uh, <laughs> two, two words, don't go together. But um, yeah, so timber, tobacco, 
uh, T also, which is a really you know really novel and also Dai. So this is an area that that we could really look at maybe challenging the Dutch position. And I'm even thinking of the possibility of landing a marine force in Acre, building a colonial fortress there, building a kind of presence there, getting a mission, getting a trade post, and starting to expand our operation here. You know the Dutch have, uh, the Dutch kind of expansion so far into the kind of uh, western part of the island of Sumatra, kind of east of the uh, river is this the Kwampa uh, or the Kampa, is so far very half-hearted. The colonial capital is Palembang, which uh, they are much, much better established in Palembang. They have a trade coast mission. They've got everything in school, even, you know. And this is also the case for uh, uh, Bendulen, uh, where, again, they're very well established indeed. Uh, a trade post. Although we could build a mission here. Let's bear in mind that these, you know, these people are, for the most part, Islamic. So, you know, in areas where they don't have a mission, for example, what are they building here? Colonial merchants are going to have a mission here. But anyway, so the, there is there is the possibility of some expansion. Um in areas that were ahistorical for Ottoman expansion in the 19th century, but there is a, there is an historical basis, okay? And once we achieve this, we could even, you know, begin to look at the more well-established Dutch colony in Java. And let's have a look at this. This is unbelievably resource-rich. This is really well-prospected region. You've got huge access to rice, uh, you know, coffee, dyes, timber, you know, uh, uh, really, really good. Uh, silk. This is a this is a, this is an absolute kind of uh, you know it would be a real jewel in the crown for us if we could secure this. This is already a fully fledged Dutch colony, um, and I believe probably has been since the early modern period. They even have RGOs developed here, but you know who's to say it's going to remain a Dutch colony? I'm not sure what business Holland has being in Southeast Asia. I'm not convinced of that argument, you know. And um, yeah, they have really large sprawling territories that are colonially well, you know, like they're, they're resource rich, and these are all areas that we could begin to look at. As, as you know, um, places for colonial expansion that would meet the demands of an increasingly hungry, resource-hungry economy. Okay, other areas, of course, is Spain. You know, the, the the Spanish Philippines. We don't have any plans for warfare for the next ten years, but again, really, really good place for timber. Okay, uh, timber, minerals, tropical fruits, and so on. And this area is not terribly well prospected either. So, prospecting of the Philippines might even yield. Um, access to other kinds of uh, raw material. So, I think est establishing ourselves um, in the kind of um, Indian Ocean and then looking kind of east might be a worthwhile exercise, and it might be worth doing this sooner rather than later. You know, we can see, for example, that the French have tried to establish themselves in Southeast Asia, but so far this is fairly limited. Um, it's not significant. Uh, if we look at the kind of, uh, I suppose, uh, what becomes kind of Indochina in real life. This area, again, great access to rice, silk, timber, fish, you know. Um, this would bring us, of course, into conflict with France. But who knows, in 10 years' time, that may not be such a bad thing. Um, and conflict with France would mean what? You know, um, an open challenge, for sort of, uh, for control of, of North Africa. I don't know. Um, so this could be something that we could look at long term. You know, we, we're certainly not in any kind of position to fight France now. We, we're not looking to do that. But... It's worth us starting to look at colonial territories with new eyes. Areas that haven't been properly consolidated or controlled yet. All these kind of hinterlands, all these places, what resources are there? What resources can we see? What resources, if these areas are properly prospected, could they yield? Okay, and uh, that's going to be important as our economy continues to grow. We already, we already chew for a lot more iron, coal, and timber. Uh, than we have uh, any kind of capacity to, 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 to sort of uh, produce at the moment. I mean, coal will begin to offset that. We've got a coal mine in Smyrna being developed. We've got railways in Zondalak and a railway line to Ankara being developed. And we've got a coal mine also um, in Zondalak being kind of um, being constructed. The next coal mine, of course, will be in Ankara. And then we're going to extend the stretch of rail line to Sinop, which means we'll have a continuous rail line from Sinop either to Smyrna or uh, the Asian side of Constantinople. Um, so we're beginning to develop the hinterland. We're seeing a really significant demographic expansion of Western and Central Anatolia. We're seeing that these towns appearing, the populations are increasing very dramatically. So this area is becoming much more densely populated as we industrialize, as we economically develop. And that's a really, really good sign. Economically, we left the war with Austria a much more powerful country i mean in more ways than one not just prestige not just the proof that we're a serious military power again that we can kind of you know uh, take on a big power like austria and come out on top but the state revenue that we have is, is incredible it's a thousand i mean what's that i don't know let's pretend i mean is it the pound is the currency let's pretend it's units of thousands 
that's a million pounds. We've got uh, one million and sixty-two thousand pounds. Private capital is really, really good. We have uh, private. I mean, exports are incredible to begin with. We have seen a little bit of a decline in exports since the end of the war, but not a dramatic one. Uh, you can see here we're much more dependent on importing certain things: steel, coal, timber, mechanical parts. Um, you know, so we are. You know, this puts pressure on kind of um, our private capital, stockpile of private capital. But we're beginning to shift small amounts of manufactured goods to different countries. Uh, tobacco, obviously, we're you know now almost a, you know we're very much established as a tobacco exporting power. Chemicals, fruits, and all the usual things that we've kind of always exported. But you can see from just the length of the list is that we're exporting a lot less. Um, domestic market sales now continuously hold at around 100 goods or 101 goods in the national market for about 300 private capital and that is a really big increase now in the size of our domestic market if we compare that what we're in late october 57 let's compare that for example to um april 51 where the domestic market sales were 57 at about 232 we're shifting almost double the amount in terms of pure quantity of goods than we were like i don't know five years ago and um, with a you know, significantly increased yield as well. Um, in 56 domestic market sales were 63 units of goods at 204. So we're seeing now that our economy is significantly expanded. The wealth in our economy is, is, is much more substantial. You know, people can afford more things, we're shifting more things, but also things like department stores, the centralization of, of the point of exchange and so on, the, the rationalization of the process of distributing goods um, has increased um, our domestic market significantly. So that's it. The economy is looking in really good shape. We're starting to think more now about kind of long term what we're going to do. Now, I say, as I say, we're looking for a long period of peace to, con uh, to basically implement our army reforms. The first part of our army reform, I think we're going to start straight away. Let's begin building. And we've got a lot of state revenue. We've got a lot of manpower. We're going to begin building um, an additional guard core. And we're going to, oh, where can we build it? So we have an additional location where we can build it. And we're going to build this guard core in uh, Smyrna, I think. No, Constantinople. There we go. Um, so we're going to begin the construction of a guard core in Constantinople. And where is it? There it is. We'll take that. So, begins the great military reform of 1857 and the significant expansion of the guard core uh, we will be in a position i think with, with a very short space of time to build an additional guard core probably um uh, a month or two so we'll, be, we'll begin the construction of an additional guard core and they will be sent out to the uh, to join uh, the eastern army and the western theater army um so that's it they're the main take homes really like uh, the the, uh, the army reform has begun the the economy is looking in good shape we have a plan for the economy which is to kind of like really focus now on acquiring raw materials coal iron stuff like this uh, once the railroad reaches synop we're going to be looking at also expanding the railroad system uh, into the balkans uh, principally to exploit um, coal mining regions so for example uh, petric uh, niche and kosovo are three areas that are kind of a triangle here of coal production this would you know, with railroads and coal mines uh, fully developed, there's actually access to quite a lot of coal in Niche, for example, would probably, I think, uh, along with the coal mines that we have to be developed in um, in Anatolia, this would probably mean our coal demands. It would mean that we were fairly self-sufficient in terms of coal. So that's the plan also, to develop a railroad. Um, we'll look at the railroad, you know, both economically and also as a military exigence. So we'll, I guess we'll kind of move it through uh, Sofia, and then from Sofia, we can look at kind of a niche. Um, uh, we'll, we'll extend the kind of line down to Petric, which eventually, I suppose, could link up to Salonika, which means you've got a nice short line from Salonika to Sofia, and then, yeah, uh, and then into Kosovo. And I suppose from Kosovo, we'll niche ultimately up to Sarajevo as well, to link up Sarajevo. And uh, Sarajevo has completely changed. You know, God, when you think about it, at the beginning of this war, Sarajevo was like a kind of like an outback uh, position of ours, really. Sarajevo is now a major logistics hub it has a huge depot which we're going to expand incidentally it has a large fortress and uh yeah it has a permanent army corps based there so you know uh, bosnia is a different kind of thing uh, to what it was but one thing we are going to do is to begin to build a, a, a collection point in sarajevo uh with a view of properly integrating bosnia now into our national economy we're going to be looking to do that also in eastern anatolia now to start properly integrating these highly localized areas into our national economy this will drive up domestic demand give us better access to sort of commodities and raw materials there and so on 
Uh, that's it. The only other thing that we're going to do from now is we're going to found, found... It's a notional thing, really, but it's for the purpose of gameplay. It's rather immersive, and it's an absolutely worthwhile thing to do. And it's sort of it's a bit of a shout back, really, to the you know the idea that we need to take a much more procedural approach to warfare. We're in 1857, and we're going to found, along with the Army Reform, the Bureau for Strategic Planning. The purpose of the Bureau for Strategic Planning is for us to begin to develop systematic war plans and uh, based on faction you know what would happen if russia attacked us what would happen if russia got involved in some kind of war um, it was losing really badly against prussia austria sweden uh, britain you know it was falling apart it, it was in the midst of revolution on that basis we might consider expeditionary warfare against russia it would be our responsibility as the civil servants of the ottoman empire to begin to say okay we need to try and take advantage of this we could for example couldn't press any claims on territory but we could force russia to release crimea as an independent territory as a kind of cargonate as it once was and we could then begin to look to economically exploit that region this cause the areas in the southern caucasus azerbaijan georgia these areas we could force the russians to relinquish on the basis that they were in a really difficult position elsewhere the same is the case of france what if france becomes embroiled you know in, a, in some kind of model again in europe you know they go for a kind of napoleon bonaparte 2.0 the entire world's at war with them paris is about to fall they have they're in the midst of revolution and yet bewilderingly they have this colonial position in north africa which they you know as far as we're concerned they're not really any longer entitled to we could begin to you know consider something like an expedition against algeria these are not things that we're going to be doing in the next 10 years as far as i'm concerned i don't have any plans for war uh, an offensive war against anyone but we should always consider the possibility of what we would do if we wanted to prosecute an offensive war or what we would do in the event that a power would attack us now it's important that we develop strategic plans that reflect geopolitical reality that is to say threats we're not going to begin developing a really thought out war plan and spend a lot of time looking at what might happen if we went to war with britain in order to try and make a move on india which is not ever going to be on the cards as far as i can see uh, whilst in reality the principal threats to us are probably a declaration of war either from russia or from france um, in the next 10 years, I would assess that the principal threats to us come from Russia and attempt to, for Russia to get some sort of payback. Russia is now doing very well in Sweden. That will have ramifications for the quality of their troops. It means that they've got an army that's kind of like maybe functioning a bit better than it was when it last fought us and this sort of thing. Um, but they are now making headway. They've taken Stockholm. That means that war is not going to last for a very long time, I think. And once Sweden is done, where else are they going to look? You know, Russia has already been to war with us in the last seven years. It's shown that it's a very belligerent, very better coast kind of power, very expansionist, and it certainly has eyes on our Balkan territories. And it may reconsider another roll of the dice. So we need to do, very quickly, I'd say, between now and this time next year, we're going to develop a fully fledged defensive war plan so that we have a kind of procedure in place for what we do if Russia declares war on us. We've already given some thought to this. We've begun the development of a fortress at Constanta, which is uh, in the process, I believe, of being uh, expanded, which it is, and that's then going to be upgraded to being a modern fortress. And the same is the case, of course, in the East. We've got two fortresses, one in Van, uh, which is complete, one being uh, built in Batumi, and then we've got the fortress in Kars, and the fortress and cars, I think we can now begin to look at expanding and modern, uh, modernizing that fortress. Um, but we need to develop war plans. And this is how we're going to do it. We're going to codify our war plans based on the faction. So war plans green is any war plan pertaining to a war with Russia. War plans white, any plan pertaining to a, a war against Austria. War plans black. Any war plan pertaining to a war with either Piedmont, Sardinia, or more generally the Italian peninsula. Um, war plans blue will be wars uh, pertaining to France. War plans gold will be wars with Spain. And war plans red will be wars against the United Kingdom. And in any case, or in every case I should say, for the most part anyway, we will develop two plans. The first plan that we, we develop will always be a defensive plan. Uh, what we would do if Russia declares war on us? What would we do if Austria declares war on us? What moves would we make? Okay. Uh, what would we do if France declares war on us? Defensive plans would always be termed topaz. War plan blue topaz is, if you like, the administration that is required, the moves that are required for us to implement a plan that would successfully uh, defend against France. It would require some assessment as to where this war would likely take place. I guess France maybe moves through. Uh, Tunisia, they currently have uh, actually they have um, transit rights. They even have a supply train in Misrata, uh, but they would maybe look to make a move against our position in uh, North Africa. War plan 
green topaz would be you know the administration required administration being the depots and fortresses the expansion of fortresses and so on uh the forces that we need to array and also you know the plan what would we do if russia tried to move through constanta if they besieged constanta so that's topaz the other war plan which again we will develop for every faction will be Timariot. war plan green to Marriott would be if we wanted to kind of in a premeditated fashion launch an attack against russia First of all, we need to assess what, uh, assess what the objectives are, what we would want, what would be the political aim of that. As I mentioned before, maybe to try and secure the independence of something like Crimea, for the Tartars in Crimea, or for Russia to relinquish some control over the Southern Caucasus. That would be a realistic objective. okay? Um, and then what we would need to do, what administration would be required, how many supply, you know, supply trains, uh, how many ships would we need to neutralize maybe the Russian fleet in the Black Sea? Would we launch an amphibious landing? So on and so forth. Okay, so we're going to develop war plans. Uh, there, there are other possibilities, of course, for wars against Prussia, um, which is very remote. It's you know it's quite far away against the United States, Japan. We have these other factions, uh, so we will develop war plans. You know, possibly uh, with them in mind at some point. And also, of course, the Dutch. We would need to consider a war plan orange. Uh, what we would want to do, um, I suppose, a, a, an aim here would be to kind of um, take a portion of the Dutch position um, in what I suppose is becoming the Dutch East Indies. Uh, first of all, before there is any open conflict, you know, war is a continuation of politics by other means, we are going to establish the commercial and political basis for a conflict. Um, this is also something that serves our interest economically. We are going to lay the foundations for colonial presence in Southeast Asia on the island of Sumatra. We're going to start off with colonial merchants. And I think to begin with, that's all we can do. Let's make sure there are no merchants here. There's no trade post here. No trade post here. Okay. So we'll also get, uh, they have a fortress here, which is irritating, but they have missions. They've established missions. Um, So let's send our colonial merchants, increase our colonial penetration with a view uh, to begin developing trade posts um, on the west part of the island of Sumatra. This is only a Dutch influence territory, okay? You can see that they have some military control over some of the region. In one area, it looks like the British have some kind of military control. It, it, this is possible that the British just landed a small force here whilst operating off of Singapore. Uh, it doesn't look like the British have any kind of colonial penetration here. Yeah, this is the, what section is this? Yeah, the region of Jambi. Um, it doesn't look like they have any kind of real colonial penetration here, um, but the British might have just landed a force here which can account for their military control over the region. Um, we've got SEAC where the, the, the Dutch have. So the Dutch haven't commercially exploited a lot of these areas. Uh, they have in some areas, for example, they've got a mission seat even here, even in Padang where there's tea and timber. You know, they have a mission, they have a fortress, they've got a harbour. But they don't have the kind of capitalist enterprise in place to commercially exploit the region. So we're going to see if we can do that ourselves. Once we get high enough colonial penetration, we would be in a position to challenge the Dutch if they try to make a move to turn Sumatra um, into a protectorate. But it requires us to get enough colonial penetration to do that. Uh, so we're going to look to do that. There's a real commercial basis for this. We need access to timber. So that's it. They're basically our plans then. Army reform, navy reform, the foundation for the Bureau for, for Strategic uh, Planning. Um, a kind of, uh, a, a, you know, an economic plan that increasingly begins to look at getting access to raw materials to fuel our rapidly growing economy. And the economy is in really amazing shape. One thing that I've really noticed with the economy also, this is not so much the case now, is sudden drops um, in our kind of... Um, sort of uh, resource inventory, if you like, which suggests that the in fits and bursts, we're shifting large quantities of certain kinds of commodities. That's really, really good to see. Um, so, yeah, we'll keep an eye on that. But the economy is in good shape. That's it. I'm going to leave it there. The next video, then we're in late October, we'll pick up, I guess, in early January 1858, unless there's any kind of dramatic developments. I'm going to begin the process of implementing the army reform. By the time we meet again, I think probably we'll have two of the Guard Corps in place and some of the uh, corvettes, the screw corvettes, uh, I'll show you what these are that we're going to be building, will be in construction. Uh, so these are scouting squadron screw corvettes. These are going to be the first of, uh, of, of, of their kind. I don't think we actually have any screw corvettes at the moment. Uh, the, sh the corvettes that we have 
a very traditional Corvette. So it's going to be the first of its kind. Yeah, we've just got very traditional age of sale Corvettes. Um, yeah, so we'll have probably at least one of the squadrons, if not two of the squadrons, of corvettes in construction, and the two army corps will be partially assembled. The two guard corps will be partially assembled by then. But that's it. See you in early January um, 1858. Uh, thanks for watching this video, and I'll see you in the next one.